Ladies and gentlemen, we are thrilled to have you here for this epic debate, or I should say discussion, which is going to be, I think, one for the record books, folks. We are very excited about this and want to let you know if it's your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button as we have many more debates to come. So, for example, this Friday... Dr. Richard Carrier and Jonathan Sheffield will be debating the resurrection. Should be very exciting. And in addition, want to let you know we are a nonpartisan platform, so we have no positions. We leave it completely up to the speakers to make their case. We don't have any sort of after shows in which we take a position. We let you, as the audience, decide who you found most persuasive. And we want to welcome you here no matter what walk of life you come from. So with that, we're going to get into the format for today's debate, but first I really want to I want to show this you guys. I'm really excited about it. So let me just quick show you and I don't know if you guys know. I, I probably alluded to it a little bit. I grew up watching pro wrestling, but this is the coolest thing. So what I'm going to do is really I've got this huge thank you for Scott Stanford as he is a seven-time Emmy winning announcer and WWE current announcer. And he's got a message here. So let me just kick it over to Scott for this introduction of our speakers. Hey guys, Scott Stanford here, seven time Emmy Award winner from WWE. And I am excited. I'm so excited to introduce Ray Comfort and Matt Delahunty. And I want to wish them a very friendly dialogue in their debate today. Coming your way on Modern Day Debate. Thanks so much, folks. So very excited. This is, like I said, this is kind of like our Super Bowl of events. This is going to be a lot of fun. want to let you know, the format is more like a dialogue than a debate. So it's going to be a 10-minute opening statement or so from each side, and then open conversation followed by Q&A. If you have any questions, feel free to fire them into the old live chat. I will look for those questions, and if you tag me with at Modern Day Debate, it makes it easier for me to make sure I get every single question in the Q&A list. Also, Super Chat is an option. If you want to do Super Chat, you can also make a comment toward one of the speakers to which they'd, of course, get to respond to, and it will also push your question or comment to the top of the Q&A list. The only thing we ask, of course, is that you be your regular friendly selves for all of your questions questions or comments as we really do want to make our guests feel welcome we're really honored to have these guys they are in the kind of the speaking world like titans it's very fun to have them and so we really do want to make them feel welcome and so with that we're going to want to mention one last thing I have put both of the links of our speakers in the description. So that way, if you'd like to hear more, you can hear more. That's why I put those links down there so you can click away if you want to hear more. And with that, we're going to kick it over to Ray for his opening statement. But one last thing. I do want to give you guys a proper introduction. So I do want to quick mention first, Ray is the CEO and founder of Living Waters, which exists to inspire and equip Christians to fulfill the, the Great Commission. In addition, want to introduce Matt as well, who is host of the Atheist Experience, which is a live weekly call-in show, and they invite believers to call to discuss what they believe and why. So with that, we're going to kick it over to Ray and just want to say one last thanks to our guests for being here. Gentlemen, pleasure to have you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, James. Uh, I'm delighted to see Matt. I love Matt. I respect Matt. You said he said some bad things about me, and we may not be friends, but... I always count him a friend and uh, I'm delighted. The last time we met was when I interviewed PZ Myers um, here locally in Southern California. Um, Matt may remember that and I use that footage in Evolution versus God. And uh, also Matt, I just want to take a moment to thank you so much for the kindness with which you treated me when I was on the atheist experience. I've never forgotten that. And by the way, do you usually get over a million views for the videos? Sometimes, not usually. Yeah, well, I noticed that's over a million. So people like dumb old banana man by the look of it. Um, but you were very, very gracious to me. A number of times when I was over talked, I heard you say, hang on, hang on, let Ray speak. And I greatly appreciated that. So the subject today is, does the gospel make sense? And I think the best way to illustrate it is to share the gospel, but I'm going to direct it at you, Matt. And the reason for that is because I love you and I care about where you spend eternity. And Penn Gillette was right. When he said, if you believe in hell and you've found everlasting life, how much do you have to hate someone not to share the gospel with them? So, Matt, you're the man. You're the dartboard and the arrow is coming your way. 
Um, I believe you're in terrible danger, and I believe you don't believe that. And if I can convince you that you are in terrible danger, I'm doing you the ultimate favor. You know, I was uh, a believer in evolution when I became a, a Christian, but the night I became a Christian, it wasn't somebody destroying evolution that convinced me that the gospel was right. It was one Bible verse. And that is where Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon ever preached, you've heard it said by them of old, you shall not commit adultery. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I've never committed adultery. And if heaven exists, I'm going to make it there because I've not broken that commandment. And then I read the words of Jesus, but I say to you, whoever looks upon a woman to lust for her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. And it was like an arrow hit my chest. And Matt, I know you're very familiar with the gospel. You're very familiar with the words of Jesus. I'm sure you're very familiar with the story of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus, knelt down and said, good master, what should I do to inherit eternal life? It's, um, I think, Mark 10, verse 17. And Jesus said something really weird to him. He said, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. And the reason he did that, I believe, is that most of us proclaim our own goodness. We think we're good people. But then Jesus gave him five of the Ten Commandments to bring the knowledge of sin and to show him he was a sinner. And that's why every time I do a debate or witness or share, to someone, share with someone, I go through the commandments to bring the knowledge of sin because I know, Matt, that you have a conscience that bears witness with the commandments. God has taken his time to write his law upon your heart. You intuitively know it's wrong to lie, steal, murder, commit adultery, even to lust. And you know in your heart, God should be first. And when I realized that on the, day, uh, uh, on the day of judgment, when I realized on the day of judgment, I'd be guilty before God, I'd be condemned to hell justly by God, I'd be damned, that's when the cross made sense, that Christ died for our sins. You and I violated God's law. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on that cross. Matt, if you're in court and someone pays your fine, a judge can let you go and do that which is just and right. You can say, Matt, there's a stack of speeding fines here. This is deadly serious, but someone's paid them. You're free to go. And you can do that which is legal and right and just. Even though you're guilty, you can walk because someone paid your fine. And even though you and I are guilty before God under the death sentence, God can take the death sentence off us and let us legally live forever because Jesus paid the fine and full on that cross and rose from the dead and defeated death. Now, here's the rub. Most people don't realize what death is. And Matt, I'm sure you're familiar with this famous Bible verse that you learn when you're in church. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. According to the Bible, death is wages. God has paid you in death for your sins. It's like a judge in a court of law has a heinous criminal before him, and he says, you've raped three women and murdered them. I'm paying you in the death sentence. You've earned this. This is your wages. This is what you deserve. And God considers sin to be so serious. He's given us the death sentence. The soul that sins it shall die. The wages of sin is death. You're on death row, Matt. Every beat of your heart is a drumbeat of your own funeral march. And it's evidence that what God says is true. And after death, the judgment. Now, let me see if I can bring some coagulation to what I'm trying to say. Matt, imagine you woke up tomorrow morning and you had a little bit of a pain under your arm. And it got worse during the day. And you went to the doctor and says, Doc, there's this pain under my arm. And it's starting to really hurt. And the doctor looks worried and he goes away and does some tests, comes back. And he said, oh, man, I'm sorry. This is lymph node cancer. It's metastasis. Besides, you're going to be dead in two weeks. There's nothing we can do for you. I'm going to give you some painkillers. They're going to take away the pain slightly, but you're going to be dead in two weeks. So you go home and you lie on your bed. You're not interested in atheism. You're not interested in sex, partying, booze, having a good time. You're so nauseated by the drugs, the side effects. All you can think of is in two weeks, you're going to be put in a hole in the ground. And you're saying, I wonder if there is a way to find everlasting life. And this isn't some weird scenario. Over 600,000 Americans will die of cancer in the next year. So have you come up with an answer? Well, I have. Christ died for our sins, rose again on the third day. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And this is the reason the gospel makes no sense to someone who's proud of heart, someone who won't acknowledge their sins. If you're on the freeway, 
And I suddenly stopped you and said, hey, man, someone's paid a fine for the law that you broke. You'd probably say, that doesn't make sense. I haven't broken any law. What are you talking about? I don't need, what are you saying? I'm a lawbreaker. The good news of a fine being paid for you will be foolishness. It won't make sense. But if I take the time to say, the area you just dro drove through at 75 miles an hour was set aside for a blind children's convention. 15 miles an hour was the maximum speed. There were signs everywhere. You're in big trouble. You'll go in jail for a long time. Or you've got this massive fine that someone's paid it. Now, because you realize how serious your transgression is, the fine being paid for you is not foolishness. It makes sense. And it's exactly the same with the gospel. If someone's proud and self-righteous, they don't see sin as being serious, the gospel will make no sense. Christ paying the fine for I don't need that. I'm not a sinner. But once you realize how serious sin is, that it gives you the death sentence, that God's wrath abides on you, you're an enemy of God in your mind through wicked works, once you acknowledge that with a good and honest heart, you've got a humble heart, then the good news of the gospel makes sense. It's the best news you could ever hope to hear, that God can grant you everlasting life, not as a spook on a cloud playing a rusty heart for eternity, but God says you can have everlasting life. I'll prove it to you. I'll prove myself to you. All you've got to do is give up the fight, stop the rebellion, repent and trust in the Savior, and God promises he'll reveal himself to you, even if you're an atheist. It's happened to many atheists, happened to me and Matt it's my deepest prayer that you consider what I've said today because my motive isn't to win a debate it's to win you because I love you and I care about you over to you Matt take me to pieces thanks so much Ray and absolutely we'll kick it over to Matt the floor is all yours Oh, I didn't, I didn't notice anything about time. So, hey, welcome. Uh, I, I got a bunch of questions uh, that came to me. I'll, I'll have questions for Ray later, but a lot of people were like, wait a minute, why are you doing this debate with Ray? You swore you'd never debate Ray again after the last time when he said he does not interested in debate. He just loves you. Yes, I said that. Uh, this is not a really structured debate. We're stating our positions and then we're going to discuss it, which, okay, if you want to pit, pick nits, then yes, I'm debating Ray, uh, which is fun. So, I, uh, when I'm looking at this, the first thing that comes into my mind is, okay, we want to make sure that we're talking about something different that Ray and I haven't discussed before. So it's not slavery. It's not the existence of God. It's the gospel message and whether or not it makes sense. So this isn't about everything uh, or anything that just happens to appear in the gospels. I'm not going to be worried about how to reconcile the Easter accounts, although that's a wonderful subject to potentially debate as I don't think it can be done. I'm not worried about genealogy or historicity, just concerned with the message. And so the first thing I had to do was think, well, what did I understand the gospel? message to be when I was a believer. You know, I have I have a Jesus fish hat around here that I would occasionally like to put on, but I won't do it during the debate. What I understood the gospel message was that uh, man brought sin in the world through disobedience. This created an issue where there was a separation from God and righteousness. There's nothing that we can do, no works that we can do, nothing that we can accomplish that is going to that is going to alleviate this uh, uh, wrong that we've done, uh, and it will eternally separate it from God. And then Jesus dies and is reborn uh, to forgive us of our sins, and that's this is the mechanism that provides salvation from the debt you owe uh, by grace through faith for those who believe. And although, to be clear, because I talk so much about belief, I don't remotely think the gospel is just an intellectual exercise in believing that there's a God. That's not what believe in means in that context. But there's a number of problems here. Uh, I won't get into whether or not a God exists other than to say that is an issue because it's like, you know, when we get to the to the end of Ray's opening and, and you're talking about me speeding and there's signs everywhere, I'm sure we'll deal with that in detail. But the first issue is who put up those signs? Is that a recognized authority that can actually enforce the law? I don't have that when it comes to God. The notion of sin itself is something that I find strange. I don't know how you could wound a God. I don't know how you could wrong a God. Um, but it, cause it boils into like thought crimes too. You know, if you, if you've thought something, then you're guilty. Cool. But the notion of original sin is problematic because did God know that, well, we'll just stick with the Bible as writ. Did God know that Adam and Eve were going to fail, that they were going to disobey, that they were going to eat the fruit of the tree that he specifically said they shouldn't? Was there any way that that could have gone any other way? Is it possible that God could have created a universe in which there wasn't 
uh, inevitable sin? And did God know this ahead of time? Because if God knew this ahead of time and could have done differently, then God's the one that made the decision to bring original sin in the world, not Adam and Eve. Then there's this notion of inherited sin, which is not that I'm born guilty for what I'm actually doing, but that I'm already born guilty because of what other people have actually done. This notion of inherited sin it begins with original sin. It progresses such that we are all guilty carrying on the sins of the Father, not through necessarily what we've done, but because of what was done prior to us. It reminds me, uh, and I'm, my, my relation, first of all, my relationship with my father is fine, but it reminds me of a time when my dad gave me a beating and when uh, he found out or, or had a good suspicion that I hadn't actually done the thing uh, that, that got me the beating, he said, well, then that was for something else that you did that I didn't catch you for. It's this notion that the beating, first of all, which we shouldn't beat any children. I don't care what the Bible says or anything else. Let's listen to actual science and psychology. Let's not hit people and encourage and teach people to hit people. But this notion that you had it coming, even if I didn't know about it, is similar to this. Then you have the Jews, who are God's chosen people in the Old Testament, uh, who had a bunch of blood magic rituals. Essentially, in order to appease God, they would have to kill and slaughter animals and light them on fire, and the smell of burning animals was pleasant to God's nose. That is blood magic. It is, it, it is of the things we're talking about, whether or not the gospel message makes sense, this is where the nonsensical part begins. This is, this is the, the, the things that most Christians that I met and would have interacted with um, would put down as, no, 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 that's not of God. Not the sacrifice. Sacrifice, yes, but the blood magic. They just don't recognize the tie to it. So then Jesus becomes a special case sort of blood sacrifice. But the question is, why can't God just forgive people? If God created people, God created the rules, God's the enforcer of the rules, God wants to be lenient, he's the judge, he's the one that says, hey, you're never going to deserve your place in eternity, I'm going to give it to you anyway, but only if I get to come down and take human form and kill myself and sacrifice myself to myself to serve as a loophole for rules that I'm in charge of, and then to find out who's actually going to accept all of that. Specifically, you know, the gospel message is, is that this is what a God did, an all-knowing, all-powerful being created people, created the rules about their thoughts and behavior, defined some of those things as bad or that they weren't preferable to him, specifically created a universe where things go wrong, knowing that they would go wrong, specifically such that some people would be saved to heaven and others would be damned to hell. And so sin is just a concept of, God, of doing whatever it is that God doesn't approve of. Yet I have no evidence of a God or what a God approves of or disapproves of. I only have the claims of men. And we'll reference yet another Bible verse, uh, let God be true and every man a liar. So if God wants me to know his rules, he can tell me himself. Uh, it's strange that I'm somehow responsible through inherited sin for the guilt of other people. But when I'm told, you know, hey, you've done things yourself that are against what God wants, you're, you're absolutely correct that I have done, in fact, many things that are against what some people tell me God wants. So if the, what we're looking at here is, does the gospel make sense? Let's look at it from a strategic standpoint. If you're God, what is your, your goal? I, I'll be interested to hear what Ray thinks God's actual goal is, but there's a couple of possible goals. If your goal is to get a bunch of people who agree with you and love you to spend eternity with you, why not just create them all with you to begin with? Why this tap dancing rigmarole of creating a bunch of people, having the vast majority of them or some sizable chunk of them be damned to hell after a life of suffering or misery or happiness or whatever they ended up getting out of it? Because this life is like what you're being judged on, but it's not anything significant. It's like, it's like dirty rags, according to scripture. So why not just create the chosen people in heaven and leave everybody else out of it? Uh, if the goal is to get some people, specifically the people who like you and who you like to spend eternity with you, that's the most efficient plan. Create those people in the location with you. What, what's a boneheaded way to do this? And that would be to create a universe, wait billions of years, create a man out of mud and a woman out of that man, tell them not to do something that you know they're going to do and then threaten them with death. And then when they do it, don't kill them, just make their life difficult. Then go through a comedy of errors of having people fall or fail to love you or listen to you or obey you over and over, flood the world, start over again, confuse their languages in order to try to start over again, encourage war, gradually go from walking and talking with them to not interacting in any detectable way and then magically impregnate 
a young girl so that you can take human form as a sort of God man that's fully God, but fully man, which doesn't actually make sense, so that you can sacrifice yourself to yourself as a blood magic loophole for rules you're in charge of. So you can set aside your own anger because that's the thing that we're being saved from is God's wrath. Uh, it's just that it's declared to be justice. Uh, and, and then expect future generations to believe without sufficient evidence. I mean, God's interaction with the world vanishes in direct correlation to our ability to accurately investigate the world. So God's genius plan seems more nonsensical with each new dawn and each new discovery. The silence is deafening and the model doesn't make sense. Perhaps the goal might be to teach people that you have to go through and live life, the, the hard knocks lessons, uh, that way of actually learning and understanding. But which is a better way of teaching, a classroom with an actual instructor there to guide, or one where the students just show up with a list of things they believe that the teacher wants us to investigate? It'd be like saying, I really want a ham sandwich with Gouda cheese on a sweet Hawaiian roll, so I'm going to start by dumping a bunch of people in a grocery store and letting them just experiment. And early on, I might steer them a little bit, but I'm going to get increasingly less involved to the point where no one can even demonstrate that I'm still around or want any sort of meal at all. It's a bad plan. Just make the sandwich you want. You're a god. You can do whatever you like. This variety of proposed plans feels more like the flawed thinking of men and less like the all-knowing product of a wise god. About a minute left. Uh, Ray mentioned Matthew 10, 17. I think you mean Matthew 19, 16, because that was in the notes for what I asked you. That's the, the passage. Mark, Mark 10, 17. Mark 10, 17. All right. Matthew 19, 16 is the one I was referencing. But we'll get into that. Hmm. So that, that's it. Matt, you're the straw man king. That was amazing. I could write a book on everything you said there, but let's just pick up some of the things you said. Uh, one of them is that God didn't give any signs about the speed. Yes, he did. He's given you a conscience. He's written it with a, a pen of a diamond on your heart. Conscience is so powerful. It drives many men to drink and some to suicide. It's how, do you, how do you show that God gave me a conscience? Yes, sir. It's society shaped, but it's God given. How do you, how do you know that? How can you show that? You, well, you can sit here all day long and tell me that my conscience is God-given, but also my conscience does not clue me into the same things being wrong that yours does. That's exactly right. The Bible says you sear your conscience as with a hot iron. You know what seared steak is? Just on the outside, it's cooked, but on the inside, it's soft and tender if you cut it with a knife. If we cut your conscience with a knife today, the knife of God's law, we'd find out that it's written on your heart. You know it's wrong to steal, don't you? Um. I know that it's wrong to steal, but not because of a conscience or because it's written on my heart. You know it's wrong to lie, don't you? I don't know that it's always wrong to lie. I know that it's situationally wrong to lie. For example, if Anne Frank's up in my attic and the Nazis come knocking on my door to ask me if there's any uh, Jews in my attic, I'm going to lie and say no. Would you think, would you agree that's a good thing? Yeah, I agree. The Genesis says that. The, the, the midwives were um, smiled upon by God because they lied to Pharaoh about the children that were being born because they didn't want to commit, uh, commit murder. So I, I'd, I'd hide Anne Frank also, so I'm with you there. Hey, have you ever used God's name in vain? Uh, how many, you want just today or this week or? Yeah, now, why would you do that? I don't know what God's name is because I don't know that there is a God. I've used the names of many gods over the years um, uh, in, in conversation in ways that you, other people might find uh, Matt, would you your, Matt would you use your mother's name as a cuss word well I don't use anybody's name as a cuss word I'll use it in conjunction with a cuss word like yeah, they use the name of Jesus, they use the name of Jesus as a cuss word I've used it as an expletive I don't know that it's yeah, that's what I mean. how, how can so if I say Jesus Christ yeah um what about that makes it cussing as opposed to praising. Using it in vain, letting it run off your lips with no due honor. That's what yeah. it means to take it in vain. Yes. And Matt, no one would, would use his mother's name as a cuss word. That would be a horrible insult to her. And when you take God's name and use it as a cuss word, it's called blasphemy. You know it's wrong. It's written on your part. So I don't know it's wrong. I don't agree that it's wrong. And I don't know what – see, this is the thing. You keep making assertions about what I know, and they're wrong. And so if I – how, how would you, how, how does it feel if I tell you you know something and you're sitting there saying, wow, this guy really doesn't know me because he doesn't seem aware that I don't know the thing he's accusing me of? Yeah, and well, here's my problem. I have an instruction book that is inspired by God that tells me all about you. God knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows how you many? by name. <laughs> I, I don't know. God knows. But let okay, me finish. So what I, let me how finish do you know that that's even true? Let me finish what I'm saying because okay. it's so important. 
He knows how many hairs upon your head. He knows the moment of your death. He sees every secret sin you've ever committed. And every time you sin, you store up his wrath. The instruction book for humanity, the Bible, tells me exactly what you know. That You know in your heart that God exists. The, the heavens declare his glory. When we broke from Britain, we didn't say, hey, we might be thinking of leaving. No, it was the declaration of independence. And Psalm 19 says the heavens declare the glory of God. Every time you look at the heavens, you know God exists, but you deny him because of the moral responsibility. Now, that's, that's what the instruction book tells me. That's how I say I can know because the instruction book tells me about him. Matt, well, you you're, the, so, so what you're saying is you have a book that tells you something, so you can't possibly be wrong. And yet I'm looking at you telling you that you are in fact wrong about what I do or don't know. That's right. So Matt, you remember the prodigal son? Yes. Why did he go to a far country? Remember, he, he said, Dad, give me all my money. And the Bible says he went to a far country. Why do you think he went to a far country? I don't know, probably looking for change. No, he was wanting to get in with prostitutes. And I'm sure he didn't want to do what he wanted to do under his father's nose because he knew his father. Was what's, what's wrong with prostitutes? What's that? What's wrong with prostitutes? I didn't say anything was wrong with prostitutes. I said he went to a far country to get away from his father because he wanted to go and visit prostitutes. And he knew what he was doing wrong and his father would frown upon it. But this is what evolution is. Oh, sorry, this is what atheism is. It's a far country. You want to get as far away from God as you can because God demands moral responsibility. That's what my instruction book tells me. It says, you love darkness rather than light because your deeds are evil. Neither will you come to the light, lest your deeds be exposed. Atheism or atheists stay away from the gospel and hate the light for the same reason criminals hate the police. They'll call them pigs. They'll kill them, even not because of who they are, but because of what they stand for. And Matt, that conscience is on your heart and it's on my side. And when we go through the commandments to talk about adultery and lust, fornication and pornography, we know in our heart we're morally wrong in God's except, sight. Except we don't. First of all, I don't know anything in my heart. I know things in my head, but I'm, I'm fine with the colloquial and the, and the poetic. Okay. Um, so first of all, what the prodigal son story says is that he basically wanted, he, he ran off to go live a wild life. It doesn't say anything at all about prostitutes, correct? Is there a single, is there a single version of the Bible that mentions prostitutes in that all story? Of them. All Jesus of them? Where? Because the father came, the son came to the older son came to his father and said, your son went and visited prostitutes. It's in the scripture. Uh, yeah, but that doesn't, okay. The, so the story Jesus. is that he left to go live a wild life. Prostitutes may be a part of that, but you seem to portray that as his primary motivation. I just yeah. wanted to know where it says that that was his actual motivation. It yeah, seems to me good. like it seems to me like a, a, a fairly fairly typical story of I don't want to live here on the farm. I want to take my inheritance and go off to the big city and see what the rest of the world's like. Right. Okay. Yeah. And you know what brought him to his senses? He began to desire pig food. And that's what you need to realize, that your desires are unclean in the eyes of God. All of us are. That's what brought me to Christ. When I realized I was burn, burning with unlawful sexual desire and that God being holy had seen my thought life and I was in big trouble on judgment day and would justly end up in hell, that brought me to my senses. And that's what I'm hoping will happen to you today. You'll say, boy, if God is holy and perfect and he's seen my thought life, my sexual desires are unclean. All of us do. We drink iniquity like water. So we're like moths to a flame when it comes to pornography. I mean, when did you last look at pornography? Today. Yeah. And so you're addicted to it like every male. I'm not addicted to it. There's no such thing as porn addiction, but I'm definitely not addicted to it. But yeah. also, you haven't demonstrated that there's anything wrong. You come in with this package that begins with, like, the entirety of your, your opening is, um, and you're right, it was Mark 10, 17, but I think you said Matthew 10, 17, and I was going with Matthew 19, 16, so that was the thing. I had them both in the notes there. Um, you talk about, hey somebody came up and paid your fines for you um, and, and that I'm the king of straw men. Yes. All right. God created the world, right? Yes. And did God know everything that would happen in this cool. world? He's omniscient. God knew that I would be an atheist. There's no such thing as an atheist, man. You know that. No, I don't know that. As a matter of fact, if all you're going to do, this is, this is so bloody embarrassing, Ray, for you just to keep coming in and starting something. I genuinely do not believe that a God exists. Yeah, but you know you need total knowledge to be an atheist. That's what No, God you don't. No, I'm not asserting absolute certainty that there are no gods. Atheism is the position of not accepting that there is a God. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't accept that there's a God. Right. 
Did God, that, that's what I'm going to call atheist. I'm a non-believer. Did God know I was going to be a non-believer? He knows all about you, Matt. I, I, okay. Could God have created a different universe where things went differently? Where, for example, I became the preacher that I set out to be? Yes. Okay. So if God created this world when, where I end up an atheist, instead of the world where I end up a believer, then God made the choice that resulted in this particular universe over another one, correct? Yeah, but, man, this is like Yeah, a, but. There's no but here. God I mean, made the choice like that resulted in this universe. No, I've just made an ironclad argument based on your own statements that God is the one that is ultimately responsible for choosing the universe in which I'm a non-believer as opposed to choosing the universe where I'm a believer. That means that the ultimate responsibility for that decision is not mine, but his. Oh, like, let me address that because you brought it up before in your first straw man. Well, one of the first. If you stand in front of a judge in a court of law and you're guilty of committing a serious crime and you say, God maybe did it, God maybe do it, it's not my fault, it's God's, it's original sin. That's why I raped that woman, so it's God's fault. It's not going to hold water even in a civil court. Oh my, uh, that's not what I'm remotely saying. So, so first of all, I don't recognize that there's some God that has authority over me. You're telling me I've broken God's law. I don't recognize that there is a God or, or that God's law can be broken. That's just the thing. I'm not saying, I'm not making a case that says, I, in fact, in reality, am not responsible for my actions. I'm saying that under your model, since God made the decision to create the universe in which I become a non-believer, as opposed to creating the universe in which I become a believer, God is the one that is responsible. He's, he's decided everything. Everything has happened according to God's plan. There is no free will in your model. There is no individual responsibility in your model. The fact that you're choosing not to believe in God's existence. I don't choose. It's not a choice. We yeah, will, Matt. We know that this is, it's, it, it's just ridiculous. So, okay, Matt, well, I'm, I'm sorry, but just simply making assertions and saying something's ridiculous is not an argument and it's not evidence. Okay, let me say something positive here and correct me if I'm wrong. An atheist is someone who believes the scientific impossibility that nothing created everything. No, I, you're, you're wrong. That, none of that has anything to do with atheism. Atheism is, is a single issue. Are you convinced that a God exists? If the answer is yes, you're a theist. If the answer is no, you're an atheist. You can, you can be an atheist and believe all kinds of really silly stuff. You can, you can believe that you can deny science and think that vaccines cause autism. You, you can deny science and think that the earth is flat. That, you can do all of those things as an atheist. There, the atheism isn't a worldview. There's no, there, there are things that are, you know, if you don't believe in a God or if you don't believe in the supernatural, which is separate because some atheists could in fact believe in the supernatural. I don't. Uh, I don't see any mechanism by which we can demonstrate the supernatural is real. It, this is, how many years have we, granted, it's been a number of years since the last time you and I interacted, but this isn't the first time somebody's explained to you how I use the term atheist. I know because I've done it before myself. So why are you, coming back to me to say that here's what atheist means when you know damn well from all the past conversations we've had what I mean by it. Richard Dawkins, Lawrence Krauss, P.C. Myers, and seven other leading atheists are not in this room and would agree with me. Let me finish. They believe, and I have quotes in a, a video online called Crazy Bible, in which Dawkins, Krauss, P.Z. Myers, and other well-known leading atheists believe the scientific impossibility that nothing created everything. Not that nothing was in the beginning. They believe nothing was the prime mover. Is that what you believe? No. So what do you believe created everything? I don't have an answer for what or if anything was created. I have no problem with the notion that the universe existed forever in some form, but... None of those, why, I, I, this has nothing to do with atheism. That's not the definition of atheism. That's not the usage of atheism. Atheism doesn't tell you anything about what someone believes about the origin of the universe. Atheism addresses what someone does or does not believe about a God. Not true. You watch Crazy Bible, it's had over a million views, and it gives the definition of atheism. It says these guys believe nothing created everything, and they say what was in the beginning. They, yeah. They, they say yeah. what they believe was in the beginning. There was nothing, and the nothing created everything. Atheism. Well, good luck getting a debate with them, but today you're here with me. So can we address what my position is, or are you just going to keep strawmanning me with what other people have said? Well, Lawrence Krauss won't debate me. He gave me four questions when we met together. I wasn't allowed to ask any more because he's yeah. afraid. It's Dawkins. It's what? 
Dawkins won't debate me. Of course not. Why should he? Why should anybody? If all okay. you, you, so you, first of all, you, no, no, no. nobody, nobody should be debating you because you flatly said in the last attempt at a debate we had that you don't care about debate and you don't care about proof. And in this, in, in this discussion, your entire position is predicated on an assertion that there is a God who is a judge of the world. And then let's let, let's take a look and make see if the Bible makes sense if we begin with that presupposition. But you cannot look at it, you will not, you refuse to look at it as if we don't begin with that presupposition. You've provided zero evidence. All you've done is make one assertion after another after another, right out to telling me I'm wrong about what atheism is. How monumentally arrogant is that? Hey, Ray, you're wrong about what Christian is. That doesn't worry me at all. I'm secure in my beliefs. You can say I, what you want. I know you are. You don't get angry. But but the, but but it's you not it's not about whether or not you're secure because you said something that you said if you you, you believe I'm in terrible danger and that yeah. if you convince me you're doing me a favor. However, that's not true. Because if you're wrong and you convince me, then you did not do me a favor. That's right. So so, um, so the whole issue here is whether or not you're right. How do we know whether or not you're right? All you've got to do is obey the gospel. As I said before, if you repent, you know, Matt, I've got a very difficult task because the hardest people to reach are those who are vaccinated against the truth. And that's what happened. You, you had a false conversion, like millions of others. You went to church, gave your heart to Jesus. You didn't truly repent. And in a time of trial, tribulation, temptation, persecution, you fell away like millions of others has, have. And the Bible says your latter end is worse than the first. Thank you for proving you don't know me at all. I oh, guess I do, Matt. I've heard you share your testimony. You don't, because the caricature that you just did, I didn't have trials and tribulations that led me away. Not once. Mm -hmm. Not not remotely. So did you know the Lord or not? Um, so here's the thing. No, but I don't believe that anybody knows the Lord. That's the thing. Well, when people say, when people say, oh Matt, you weren't a true Christian, if they mean that I did not have an actual relationship with the risen Christ, then they're correct. But I don't believe that anybody does. But if they, if they, what they mean is that I did not sincerely believe that was the case, then they are wrong. And yeah. because I sincerely did believe that was the case. And so did everybody who surrounded me, including my parents who thought I was going to be a million, including people from my former church who came to a debate that I did with Mike Lacona specifically to say, Hey, I was a deacon at your church. I knew you, I knew you loved the Lord. What happened? So you can you can sit here all day long and do the Matt was never a true Christian because I don't care. None of that goes to show whether or not you're right. It just keeps showing how how right you think you are, which is absolutely obnoxious. Matt, you just judged every single Christian on this earth and says they don't said they don't know the Lord. I know the Lord. Millions of Christians do. You didn't know the Lord. You had a false I didn't say that. I said I do not believe that. I'm open to being convinced. I didn't say you don't have a relationship with Christ. I said, I'm not convinced that you do. And okay, you need to well, do some convincing work that doesn't just involve claiming that I'm wrong, misrepresenting my life, making assertions about what I know when I don't know it. It's obnoxious. Okay. The Christian, according to scripture, is someone who knows the Lord. That's what the Bible says. It's the book of Hebrews, when someone's born again, they come to know God. You didn't. You were deceived. You did what Judas did. You followed Jesus for a few years, and you fell away in time. Do it again. Do it properly. This time, truly repent, and what you, when you put your hand to the plow, you won't look back because God will make you fit for the kingdom. You know, so you're saying that there's nobody in the history of the world who's ever sincerely believed who is now an atheist. I don't know why you're bringing the word sincere. Sincere doesn't matter. You can be sincerely on a plane heading for New York. But if you're heading for Hawaii, you're in the wrong direction. Sincerely you're believing, with truth. sincerely believing that they have a relationship with Christ, is what I'm talking about. Yeah, they may be wrong. Oh, mm -hmm. well, like now you've just set up a scenario where you can't be wrong. Congratulations. Well, well, like happened to you. No, no, no. You, you don't get no, no, Ray. I swear to the God that you believe in. If you make one more accusations about what happened to me that just isn't true, we're just done. Okay. I don't care about the rest of this discussion. Just stop asserting that you know my brain better than I do, because you're wrong, and you're going to. You look incredibly foolish doing this. Okay. Let's change the subject a little bit. Okay. I'm down, Matt. Evolutionary charts 
You know, nope. the little bent over guy who's slowly straightening up, walking to the right. Familiar with that? Am I familiar with it? Why are we talking about evolution? The issue here is whether or not the gospel makes sense. Well, this will make the gospel make sense when you realize the foundation you build upon is erroneous. Uh, Just explain to me but, what I've wait, got. The foundation that what's built upon is erroneous. Evolution. All right, I, I'm the whole point here. Wow, I, you just you just caused me to lose a bet. I'm pretty sure, mm. because the whole point here was discuss the gospel, and they're like, nope, Ray's just going to show up parading his ignorance about evolution that he's been corrected on a million times. And I'm I, I argued on your behalf, and I said, hey, that's not fair, because the fact that you think Ray has been corrected doesn't mean that Ray thinks Ray has been corrected. All all in Ray's mind, all that's happened is that you've told him that he's wrong, and he just doesn't accept it. Now. If we're going to talk about whether or not the gospel message is sensible, it would be nice to address the, the the position that I took and address the position that you took. But if you're just going to try and prop up this, I, I, I mean, do you think that my acceptance of the model of evolution is why I'm an atheist? I think it's your foundation. You're wrong. See, you should really, I pretend to read minds on stage and I'm actually pretty good at it. You should never pretend to read minds on stage or at all because you're bad at it. You my, it. my acceptance of evolution is in no way foundational to my not believing that a God exists. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand that, they're two different issues. Well, you just said the opposite. Well, don't you believe evolution? Am I wrong? I, I do I believe evolution, I accept that evolutionary, evolution by means of natural selection is the best current scientific explanation for the diversity of life. Yes, so but that's not why. See, do, do you not realize that I could I could have believed something and it didn't impact whether or not I believed something else, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Someone doesn't want to believe in God's existence. No, I mean, this isn't about doesn't want to believe. You, you call me the king of straw men. I have not, you have not actually done a single sentence out of your mouth that even remotely attempts to steal man what I'm saying. Every time you try to caricature what I'm saying, you come up with a straw man. It's not about what I wanted to believe. Belief isn't a choice. I didn't set out to do this. I set out to be the best Christian I could be. I set out to actually demonstrate to my godless roommate that God was real. That was the goal. You, Matt. I can't disagree with you. You know why? Because you're, you're gonna get angry and stop this debate. You're just going to walk uh, off. I, I'm not, I don't know what you mean. I'm not remotely I angry. Can't, I can't challenge you with anything because you get upset. You get angry. I'm not angry. I'm, I'm, ex I'm trying to get you to actually make a, an, an argument based in evidence and stop just claiming that you know what's going on in my head. You you don't. Go through the gospel again and see if it makes sense to you because I explain why it doesn't make sense. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing. I'm sure you know that scripture. I know it very well, but that doesn't mean it's true. The fact that you can point to a scripture and interpret it in a way that makes it look like all you just said is Matt refuses to believe. That's not true. I'm asking for evidence. I've never said Matt refuses to believe. Creation is proof of a creator. Every building has a builder. Every painting has a painter. The heavens declare the glory of God. Does, and every universe has a universer. Yeah, every every universe has a creator. No, every you universe has a creator. universer. You don't get to call it a creation. You have to demonstrate that it's a creation. You don't have to demonstrate anything. I don't have yes. to demonstrate to you that a building has a builder. It's axiomatic. You have to demonstrate that the building is a building and not just something that appears to be a building. What are you talking about? If I, if I, there's a creek out behind my house and it, and there's, I go out after a, a couple of weeks of not tending to it and it's blocked up by a bunch of sticks in mud. Is that a beaver dam or is that the result of a natural clogging of sticks and flooding? It's a result of a uh, natural clogging. How do you know? How do you know it's not a beaver dam? Okay, so let's go back to the building. The building is evidence of a builder. The painting is evidence of a painter. And it's impossible scientifically for nature to create itself because it would have had to be pre-existent to create itself before it created itself. And the other thought to you earlier on says the universe okay. could be eternal. That violates the second law of thermodynamics. Everything okay, no, it doesn't because, for, for, okay, so Ray, first of all, second law of thermodynamics only applies to a closed system. So just, I mean, you should just stop with that. Stop pretending that you understand physics at all. But I asked about a bunch of sticks blocking up a, 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 a creek. How do you determine whether or not it's a beaver dam 
or just a natural occurrence? You tell me. You tell me. So you're not going to answer. No, how could you, I? You, you said it was, it was just a natural occurrence, and I want to know how you determined it wasn't a beaver dam. Well, your analogy is that every building is just a natural occurrence. It doesn't have a build. No, my, wow, you can't understand. So, okay, so my analogy is not that every building is a natural occurrence. My analogy is that here is a structure, and we need to determine whether it was the result of an intentional design and effort or whether it occurred naturally. That's how we recognize design. We don't, not by complexity, but we recognize that, we, we compare that which was designed, which we have evidence for, with that which occurs naturally. And so if we, if we look at the sticks and we investigate and we see, you know, padding symbols from a tail and claws and, and a structure inside of it that it homes, we can begin to infer, even without the presence of an actual beaver, that this is more likely a beaver dam. And through more investigation, we can demonstrate that it is in fact a beaver dam. We can look at the way the, the sticks are chewed and everything else, plus we can see beavers at some point. That's how you tell the difference between two things that look similar. So if I have a rock that is from the right angle, looks like a person's face or profile, and one that, and another one that looks like somebody's profile. How do I tell which one's a sculpture and which one is just natural? Use your brain. Well, use your brain is not a particularly robust response to that because use your brain how? Uh, it's called common sense, Matt. No, it's, it's not called common sense. sense. Okay. That is, science is not common sense, and investigation is not common sense. This is this is the thing. If you can't just go use your common sense, your common sense needs to be trained and it needs to be trained by good information, good models, good evidence, good heuristics. It's not just something that happens. That's what's wrong is that your common sense has been mistrained and it begins by assuming that there must be a God, that, or, therefore that God is judge and you are gonna be guilty under that God. I never assumed anything. Really? Yeah, absolutely. I intuitively knew there was a creator because I saw creation. I, I knew God demanded moral responsibility. I repented of my sins and came to know the Lord. And I've known the Lord for 48 years. I've known him closer than I know my own wife. So when you say there's no evidence of God's existence, when you say I, I can't believe in, I don't believe in God because there's no evidence, all you need to do is obey the gospel. That's, the, that's the, what I threw down in front of you, the gauntlet. Just repent of your sins and confess and forsake them. Say, I blew it the first time. Lord God, please forgive my sins. Wash me clean. And God promises to reveal himself to you. You remember the Ephesians, he'll, he'll open the eyes of your understanding, take you out of darkness. And so if I've done that before and it didn't take, wh why not? Because you didn't truly really repent, obviously. Oh, so once again, you're going to pretend. See, your, your entire model is that you cannot be wrong. So when I say, hey... I did that. I repented. I, you know, and I was convinced that God saved me. I felt what I thought was the Holy Spirit. I, 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 and for years and years and years, but now you, you're going to say that because I have fallen away, it must not have been true. Obviously. Okay. Obviously. Well, that, that ladies and gentlemen is where common sense gets you. Um, unfortunately, I don't base things on common sense as much as evidence because common sense can be wrong about a lot of things. Well, you're familiar with the parable of the sower, aren't you? Yes. Remember the stony ground hearer receives the word with joy, and when a time of tribulation, temptation, persecution comes, he falls away for the word's sake. And so when Jesus is speaking of true and false conversion, he's saying the church is full of goats among the sheep, foolish virgins among the wise, bad fish among the good, and they're going to be sorted out on judgment day. And so there are plenty of people within the church who aren't converted. There are plenty of people out in the world that had a false conversion, and you're one of them, and my heart breaks for you. And, and Matt, I just care about you. I'm not trying to win a debate. My motivation is love for you. I want you to find everlasting life. I don't It'd want be to nice then if you'd stop making accusations about what I, what happened and what oh, I actually well, believe I you are. I apologize for the offense I've caused, but I've got to you, just- You're not causing a, no, no, right, right. The offense, you can tell me all day long you don't think I was a real Christian. You think I was a, a false convert. None of that offends me. Okay. What offends me is someone agreeing to come in and discuss something. And then the only thing they do is say that I'm creating straw men, and then they go on to make a bunch of assertions, provide zero evidence and zero argument. It was just, hey, I believe that, you, you might as well have come in and said, hey, I believe that Satan is the good one, 
and Satan has a bunch of rules for you. And if you don't pay attention to me and give your life over to Satan, um, you're going to wind up in a terrible, terrible situation at some point. Or you believe that aliens do in fact visit the earth and that they have a list of, of who they're going to abduct and replace uh, with, with replicants and that I'm next on their list and you sincerely believe this and all I have to do is listen to you. When you say all I have to do is do what the gospel says. Now that passage where we picked from, from different books, from Matthew 19, um, the person comes up and says, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And Jesus, depending on what, I don't know, do you have a preferred version of the Bible? Whatever. Okay, whatever. Well, I mean, because it's different. Because like in the NIV, it, it, it would say, why do you ask me about that which is good? But if you go back to King James, it's why do you call me good? And well, so, stay with King James. Sorry? Stay with the King James, so there's no sure. confusion. Okay. But in any case, in, in the King James, where it's like, hey, why do you call me good? Um, there's only one that's good, which is kind of strange because, you know, we're, we're still in this notion where Jesus is supposedly God and that he's the only, you know, air quotes human uh, that's ever been perfect. And so it would, it would be kind of strange to say, why would you call me good? But maybe Jesus is trying to teach this person something. Um, and then he says, well, what must I do? And he says, in order to have eternal life, you must keep the commandments. And then he specifically asks, which commandments? And Jesus doesn't say all of them. And he doesn't say, uh, I am the Lord thy God. Love the Lord with all your heart. None of, that, none of that. He says, you know, don't murder, don't do adultery, don't steal, don't uh, perjure, honor your parents, love your neighbor. Um, and the guy's like, I've done all that. And he said, ah, but if you want to be perfect, sell all your belongings, give them away to the poor, and then come and follow me. Now, that is supposedly from Jesus' own mouth what one must do to be saved, right? Right. So I'm supposed to sell all my, well, actually, that's to be perfect. To be good, I just need to keep the commandments. No, no, there's an error here, Matt. If you notice, Jesus added one other thing in there that most of us wouldn't. He said, defraud not. That's not one of the commandments. And I believe the rich young ruler was rich. Defraud not. Mark 10, verse 17 and 18. He said, defraud not. He threw it in there with the commandments. And I think that guy obtained his money by fraud. It seems that way. That's why he said, go and sell all the goods you've got by fraud and give to the poor. Because we know you can't earn eternal life. It's by grace you're saved through faith. You can sell all your goods, give to the poor. That doesn't find everlasting life. You can't earn God's favor. You must repent and just trust in Jesus. For by grace you're saved through faith and all of yourselves. And those commandments just bring the knowledge of sin. No one's kept all the commandments. They're, sure. They act as a mirror to show us we're sinners. That's what happened to me on the night, night of my conversion. And I have everlasting life right now. I'm sitting as old, may not finish this debate. I could go, but I've got everlasting life because I'm saved by God's mercy. Not because I'm good, but because God is good and kind. And Matt, I long for the day you come to Christ and you find the truth. And then I'm, I'm going to see you in heaven, not in hell. That would horrify so, here's me. Here's the thing. I'm, you have a... You're convinced that you have a personal relationship with, with God, right? I'm not convinced. I'm not, You're convinced. not convinced. No, Matt, I'm not convinced I have a relationship with my wife. I have a relationship with my wife. But nothing you're convinced do... of it, right? No, I have a relationship with my wife. And nothing to do with convincing anything. But no, no, no. Oh my gosh, Ray, this is so so difficult. So for every proposition, you are either convinced or not convinced. You are convinced that you have a relationship with your wife. No. I you have know? a relationship with them all. Look, to say I'm convinced sounds ridiculous. As though someone could unconvince me out of my relationship with my wife. And I have a relationship with God that I've had for 48 years. It's going to take me through death. I came into this world with nothing. I'm going to leave with my hand in the hand of Jesus. And I want how, to Okay. Him. How can I know you have a relationship with your wife? You don't. I, I didn't say how, how do I. I said how could I? Could you, how could you demonstrate to me that you have a relationship with your wife? You could come around here. It could be putting on an act. So I can't, I can't do that. I can't convince you and show you a marriage certificate. It could be made up. You've got to have faith. So what I'm saying- No, 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 no. I don't have to have faith. I can look at, so, so there's a lot of things that somebody could do. Like I'm no longer married, but when I was married, I could easily convince anybody, uh, you know, who, who's not, you know, somehow deficient that I am in fact married and have a relationship with my wife. We lived together for a decade nearly. How would you do that? So, so a relationship as defined as two people interacting in some way jointly for some period of time 
I can have good relationships, I can have bad relationships. But the fact that my wife and I got married, got a marriage certificate, filed it with the, the government, it is there as an official document, represented, 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 represented ourselves as married, lived together and entertained people, other people interacted with this, there's a mountain of evidence that I had a relationship with my wife. Not if I say I don't believe any of it, it just nullifies it all for me, like what you do yes. with the gospel. Yes, and this is why I said I could demonstrate to anybody who didn't have some d defect. <laughs> You can't so you can't just say I'm not going to believe it. That's what you do. No, it's not. This is the great lie that you tell all the time. I'm trying to show I'm trying to show that there's a fundamental difference between the evidence you can provide for a relationship with your wife and a relationship with a god. The relationship with a wife, you could easily demonstrate to me and I think that you absolutely know that you like all you had to do was say here's my wife and I would take your word for it. Yeah, I have, you have faith. No, I would have confidence based That's on faith. evidence. Confidence, is, confidence, confidence, confidence is, is not faith. Faith is the, the excuse people get for believing something when they don't have a good reason. That's if you not, have a good reason, you give it. It's not true. Trust and confidence are the same thing. Give me, give me three. So let's say, let's say that I said, Ray, I don't believe you're married. What are the first three things you would do to try to prove to anybody that you were married? I wouldn't bother. Okay. It, I, so if you're not going to be an honest interlocutor, I don't know what to do. Man, I can show you the marriage certificate, but if you didn't believe it, it's that's not, not the point. that's not the point, Ray. Stop pretending that you can read my mind and just answer the question. If someone came up to you and said, "Please prove to me that you are married," what are what's like just three things well, that you would try to do? You show marriage. a marriage certificate, mm -hmm. and that's about it. You wouldn't introduce them to your wife and have them vouch for you as well. I would. Huh? I said, "This is my wife, Sue." They gotta sure. believe that. And then if if you say you're in a relationship with Sue and Sue says she's in a relationship with you, you don't think that would be comp convincing to almost everybody in the world? Almost. Some people might say sure. I don't believe that. Can you do any of those two things for God? Yes. Where's the where's the certificate of your relationship with God? The scriptures. That the, no 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 those scriptures happen. existed before you. That cannot be that cannot be a document that shows your relationship with God. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's open. That's universal. The whole of humanity. And I've God called upon the name of the Lord, the same Lord that you called upon. The gospel truth, Matt. So, so you can't provide a certificate of your relationship, and God won't vouch for you to me. So, do, do you at least God, recognize that there's God has to vouch for me to you? Well, you, your wife would. She might. <laughs> I, I don't. So this is this is like it's like I come up with a hypothetical to expose that there's a difference between what you can demonstrate between your relationship with your wife and your relationship with God, because you try to, to, to put them on the same footing. You're not happy that I say you're convinced. So you have a relationship with God. Does he talk to you? Yes, through his word daily. We can, well, we can keep going with this just to let you know that at the same time, if we want to redirect it back to the gospel, but I'm flexible to where I know that this is tied or weaved in with the gospel so it's up to you guys i'll defer to you guys as the uh speakers well i, I just kind of wanted to see if i can finish this last thought but i'm pretty sure i know where it's going so uh, god speaks to me through his word daily so but you don't hear like hear god's voice and he doesn't say hey you should tell matt this okay so now, if i start hearing physical voices i'd see a therapist I, I'm not, I wasn't trying to go down that route, Ray. I'm trying to figure out, you're convinced that you hear from God. Millions of people do. No, no, no. Millions of people are convinced. I'm not convinced that you hear from God. You, you, well, get, in, you get inspiration through the scripture that you think is a message from God. I think you get inspiration from scripture that you have not demonstrated as a message from God and is most likely your own brain telling you what to think. How can, how, how, can some, how can an outsider tell the difference? Here's Ray, who got a message from God through Scripture, and here's John, who thinks he got a message from God through Scripture, and I'm sitting on the outside. How can I tell the difference between them? Which one's right? Search yourself. Just search the Scriptures and be as the Bereans and see if things, these things are so. That's all. But that, that begins with the assumption that the Scriptures are true. The, if the question is, are the Scriptures true, you can't begin with an assumption that they're true. Just need faith of the grain of a must, of mustard seed. That's all. Just start reading with a humble heart and say, God, please teach me through your word. It takes humility. But, but faith isn't evidence. Faith is not. If, so I could have faith that the Quran is true, right? But that doesn't mean it's true. 
That's right. So how can I know that the scripture that you're pointing to is actually true? You can't say faith. Can't tell me what I can't say. Just obey the gospel. Put the cart before the horse. Let, let me just explain what that means. If you put the horse before the cart, you're not going anywhere. I'm not trying to convince you the Bible. That's exactly how carts and horses work. You've got it backwards. I'll let you rethink put that. The horse before the cart. The cart's pulled by the horse. Obey the gospel and the scriptures will come come make sense to you. Yeah, so you're, what you're saying is you have to believe before you're going to get any no, sort of evidence. No, repent and trust Christ. I did that. See, I didn't say anything to that because you get upset. What I get upset about is when you're talking about things that aren't relevant, like what you think is in my head. Because you're really, really wrong. And, and, and that's, it's great because there's no way to demonstrate it. Just like there's no way for you to demonstrate the truth of your conviction that there is a God or that God is the, the, the lawgiver or judge of the universe or that the scriptures are true. You just take it on faith, which you said so. Well, I can't do that. I won't do that. It's not a sound epistemology. It's not a pathway to truth. You don't even care what the truth is because when I ask questions that are designed to expose a methodology to get to the truth, you just smile and refuse. I don't need to prove anything to you. Well, congratulations. You haven't. I'm ready, James. And James, you said, uh, stay with the gospel. And I've tried the best I could to stay with the gospel because I know the gospel is the power of God to salvation. And it's the gospel that Matt needs to hear to see his need of God's forgiveness. And that's why I try to open up those commandments to prepare. It's weird that you think I haven't heard it repeatedly. That's right. You've got a hardened heart and I'm praying you'll soften it up. Yeah, well. Matt, I just Better wanna... a hardened heart than a hardened brain. Yeah. Matt, I want to close by saying um, I really uh, I'm honored that you spoke to me um, when friends said don't do it because I'll preach. You still did it anyway, and I really appreciate you taking the time to listen to what I have to say. All right. Gotcha. And with that, I want to say thanks to our guest. Don't worry, we're going to Q&A. So hang on tight, folks. I want to remind you that I have put their links in the description. So that way, if you're listening and you're like, hmm, I like that. You can hear plenty more by clicking those links. And also want to let you know, I forgot to announce, we are moving to podcast in addition to YouTube. So it's going to take a couple of days. We have already started the process, but just for the processing to occur, it'll take a little bit, but just want to let you know, these will be available to everybody. So we originally had a different idea where we had it basically through Patreon, but now we said, you know what, we're going to just go public with it anybody is and we appreciate everybody who's asked before and been patient as it's been a while before we got to that and so with that we will jump into these questions want to say thanks so much everybody for your questions if case you didn't see it in the live chat any new questions from the point on in which i mentioned it in the live chat we may not get to those new questions just because we do want to respect the time of the debaters and with that first up logical plausible probable thanks for your super chat said after show will kick off right after the debate. Apparently, they're having an after show. Hope it goes well. C Kakarot, we always love this. There's nothing better than a good old debate challenge. They said, Ray, would you like to debate me on evolution? Yeah, I'd love to talk about evolution. Really interesting. Well, we can maybe, maybe here, folks. Who knows? Tiffany Bear, thanks for your super chat, said, James, thanks for making this happen. Big shout out to Ray, who is an awesome guy, praying for your ministry, Ray. Got a fan out there. And thanks for your kind words, Tiffany. It's honestly, I appreciate you folks so much. It's honestly, doing this channel is so fun for me. And so I just appreciate you all making it fun. And Athamar, thanks for your super chat. If you had a question to attach, let me know in the chat. Ray, JG, thanks for your super chat said, let's see. I'm, I'm confused by this. Unless you guys, maybe Ray or Matt, if you recognize what verse this person might be trying to allude to. JG, thanks for your super chat said, Ray should... Ray should take the surprising stance that the gospel does not make sense since the Bible says that itself. The only thing I can think of is maybe they're, a, maybe they're trying to allude to an interpretation of the verse that says that the gospel is a, a stumbling block, but I'm not sure. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to those that, perish, that are perishing. Gotcha. And BT Dubs, thanks for your super chat, who said... Matt, what would your emoji be if there is no soda can? That's right. We do. You, there's no Diet Coke tonight, Matt. Is there a Diet Coke we're not seeing? No, I've got iced tea. Gotcha. But... Banana. Diet Coke's my favorite. And do you want a see. banana? I've, I've got bananas. Good for you, Matt. 
Next up, <laughs> Scott Duke. Thanks for your super chat. Said, love this debate. Keep up the great work, modern day debate. Please have Ray introduce us to his dog. Well, exciting. We'd love to get to see. Do you still have your dog in the in the room? Yeah, Sam, come over here. Here, here. No, he doesn't want to come. <laughs> gotcha. No problem. Kevin Gilfow, thanks for your super chat, said, For Ray, would you address the problem of evil with a tri-omni god, i.e., a God that allows bone cancer in children. He created Satan knowing what Satan would do. Isn't God responsible for this? And how can you serve this unjust God? Yeah, I think it's interesting that sinful man stands a moral judgment over almighty God. Instead of just looking at bone cancer in kids, let's look at cancer in all human, human beings. How 600,000 people will die, can, will die of cancer next year. What about earthquakes and famines and hurricanes and tornadoes and tsunamis and all the pain and suffering. All those things do is substantiate the truth of what scripture says. It says we live in a fallen creation. So suffering, disease, pain and death substantiate what the Bible actually says. The whole of creation groans and travail waiting for the manifestation of God. And so uh, don't use those as excuses to reject God. See them as very real reasons to accept what the word of God says. Fallen creation, all those things are evidence what the Bible says is true. Yeah, I'd like to point out that the question was basically, hey, how do you reconcile this with this? And Ray's response was, what aboutism? Let's look at all these other things too. Why aren't you objecting to those? It was not even remotely in the ballpark of addressing the actual subject. Well, Which I thought is, awesome. is the habit for today, evidently. Yeah. Well, let's see. We'll go to the next one. And unless, uh, let's see. We do have a, we're going to try to speed through these. So Robert Luscombe, thanks for your super chat, said, Matt, people say I look a lot like you. Do you find it difficult being such a sexy beast? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, another guest said, named Religion is BS. Uh, can guess what side they're siding on today. Said, hey, James, love the debate. Monday, uh, my comment is for Matt. If we got paired in a tag team debate, I'd be so excited. I'd lose control of my entire existence. You have a fan out there, Matt. This uh, anamorphic. Well, we, we won't be in a tag debate then. <laughs> anamorphic mind. Thanks for your super chat. Said question for Ray. Why, after debating this for thousands of years, are we no closer to agreeing which God is real or even if there are any gods at all? That's a great question. The first of the Ten Commandments answers that question. There's only one creator. Hindus have something like 350 million gods. Man takes great joy in creating a god in his own image. Richard Dawkins does that. He's actually an idolater. He's created a god in his own image, an offensive, angry god that he's pulled from the Old Testament and structured to make a monster. And he says, if that's your god, I don't believe in it. But the god that Richard Dawkins doesn't believe in doesn't exist. He's a figment of his imagination, the place of imagery. And I was an idolater before I was a Christian. I made, I made up a God to suit myself. Remember the first of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Don't make up a false God, which is what humanity leans to. Uh, because if you, if you make up your own God, you, it doesn't have a moral dictate. You can do what you want when you create a God in your own image. Gotcha. Thank you. And Ray, another question for you, this one from Robert Luscombe, who said, do you believe that God knew Jeffrey Dahmer before he was born and knew that he would do what he did and yet created him anyway? Would that mean God would be just as responsible for Jeffrey Dahmer's actions? Of course not. God wasn't responsible for Hitler's actions too, and Hitler did worse than what Jeffrey Dahmer did, responsible for 11 million deaths because of what he did. Every man will give an account of himself to God. And if we want to see justice done, we rejoice that it's going to happen on the day of judgment when every secret thing that's ever been committed is going to be brought into judgment by God. And that's why we need a savior, because you and I have sinned against God. Our sins are huge in the eyes of God, enough to provoke the death sentence. That's how serious God is when it comes to sin. The problem with that answer is that Ray's already rebutted it on his own by acknowledging that God created the universe, could have created it differently, which means God is in fact responsible for Hitler because it could have created a universe where that didn't happen. Man, that's a silly scenario. It's I'm sorry that you find logic silly. If you'd stop Not finding logic log if you'd stop finding logical arguments that don't have fallacies in them silly, you might make some progress here. Not logical. It's insane. It's silly. If God had made another universe, why did nice. he 
nice wild ass assertion, but you've already just proved it by your own words. So we do have a question for Matt. We have Smokey Saint. Thanks for your super chat. Said Matt, a wealthy man found hundred or founded hundreds of orphanages in this theoretical example. They say, should he be morally excused for murdering one of the children in his care because he did so much good in founding 100 orphanages? No. Gotcha. Thanks so much. And Ronald Medanka, thanks for your super chat, said, for Ray, is it illegal or immoral for someone to enter another person's hotel room without their knowledge? Is it illegal? I don't know. Yeah, I'm confused by that one. Did we guys talk about that? I don't remember that. Logical, plausible, probable. Thanks for your super chat. Said, share your opinion. Open mic after show. So and you, if you can, folks, whether you be on the Christian position or whether you come from the atheist position, regardless, if you have an after show, let us know. We can put it in the description for you. And The Real Lock, thanks for your super chat, said... Hey, Ray, Black Lives Matter. My atheist butt has been marching for that. I'm confused. I don't remember if that came up either. Yeah, of course, Black Lives Matter. Thanks for that. And Mothra J Disco, thanks for your super chat. I don't, I'm not sure what that says, but we might come back to it. Martin Howie, thanks for your super chat. Let's see. So let's see. Apparently also from New Zealand and just kind of jumping over a couple to Ronald Bedanka. Thanks for your other super chat. Said Ray, where was the Declaration of Independence signed? At the bottom. <laughs> thanks for next Blue Heron. Thanks for your super chat. Said Ray, have you knowingly lied since becoming saved? I don't think so. I may have unwittingly, but I've tried to speak the truth in love always. Gotcha. And Kevin Gilfout, thanks for your super chat, said, If God is just and morally right, why hasn't he written Black Lives Matter on everyone's heart instead of being the absentee father figure, allowing his children to be victims of systemic racism in the U.S.? I don't think we should say that everybody is God's child. The Bible says that we're children of the devil. Satan's our father. He's the God of this world, small g, and it's only when we're born again that we come into God's family and can call God our Father. So all humanity is not God's children. Gotcha. And logical, plausible, probable. Thanks for your super chat. Hang on. You bet. Uh, so I want to make sure I understood Ray correctly. When he got to all men are, are all, all men are not God's children. Yeah. Um, th- you're, by that, you're meaning that not all are to be saved, but does God care about all of them? They're not his children. We're children of the devil. The Bible makes that clear. We're children of disobedience and rebellion to God, using his name as a cuss word. And and those are the ones that God doesn't care about. He cares about them. He loves them enough. That's all I asked. That's what I asked. Well, let me answer. He cares enough to send his son to die on the cross and says, whosoever will may come. Whoever believes in him or trusts in him will not perish, but have everlasting life, irrespective of their ethnicity. But he already knows who all those people are going to be, so he could have just created them with him in the first place. No, it's called foreknowledge. It's nothing to do with free will. It's called foreknowledge. I didn't say say the word free will. I said God knew, so he could have created just all those people already in heaven with him. No. God couldn't do that? He didn't. I I didn't say he did. I said he could have. Could he or could he or could he not done it? He could do anything he wants. You know that. (laughs) No, I don't know that. That's why I'm asking, because I don't know that there is a God. God, I don't know what your particular model of a God is. With God, nothing is impossible. That opens every door. Okay. Next up. Thanks for your super chat, logical, plausible, probable. Thanks. They said, come to the after show, and we'll link that in the description if they give it to us. Next. Dallas Wade, thanks for your super chat, said, Hi, Ray. We had a Zoom call recently, and I really enjoyed it. My question for you is, how are your arguments not moralistic fallacies? Namely, that something should be... uh, They're saying that should be so does not equal it is so. I think I'm not trying to... I'm trying to figure out if they're trying to think of the is-ought problem or if they're referring to something else. I can't Um, understand the question either. We, uh, Dallas Wade, let me know if I, if I butchered that. Sorry if I, if it was my fault. The Blazing Wizard Pope, thanks for your super chat, said, let's see. Alan Bupree asked, Ray, what's a dogma? 
A dogma? Yeah. It's a belief, I think. Gotcha. And thanks for your super chat from Matt the God said let's see. Matt, we share the same name and same worldview. Are we lost brothers? <laughs> You got another fan out there. And then thanks for your super chat. It's happy dude says my new favorite channel. This is epic. Well, all credit to the speakers. They have made this fun and I have, it's honestly a blast because of the speakers. So let's see. Birdie Brits. Thanks for your super chat said, let's see. I am a Christian and logical, plausible, probable. Thanks for your super chat said open mic after show. Come share your opinions. <laughs> you bet. And Chase Clements, thanks for your super chat, said, Ray, do you think it's a problem that, quote, Christians, unquote, can't tell if they're a, quote, true, un, uh, unquote, Christian or not, even if their belief is sincere? Well, sincerity must be coupled with truth. And the Bible says, you'll know you've passed from death to life because you love the brethren. You'll know you've passed from death to life because certain things happen. The scriptures speak of things that accompany salvation. So, you can be assured of everlasting life if you bear fruit, the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of praise, the fruit of thanksgiving, fruit of repentance. And so just examine yourself and see if you're in the, in the faith. And if there's hypocrisy in your life, you need to re-examine yourself and, and make a calling election sure, because there are plenty of people who are pretenders, fake Christians. Jesus warned on the day of judgment, they'll cry out to him, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. I never knew you. There are people who call themselves Christians, but never depart from iniquity. So make sure you're genuine, that you're, you're coupling truth along with sincerity. And then read the word daily and let the word read you. Because if anything will keep you from the scriptures, it's sin in your heart. Gotcha. And Patreon question from Brian Stevens. Thanks so much. Said, an internal critique shows that the God of the Bible can send people strong delusions. How can anyone know God isn't currently sending them a strong delusion? Well, the strong delusion of scriptures came upon those who deliberately chose to reject the truth and believe a lie. And it says, therefore, God gives them over to a reprobate mind. If they want to be unclean, God says, you can have uncleanness, but you'll have what comes with it. You know, sin is incredibly pleasurable. Pornography is incredibly pleasurable. But whenever sin is mentioned in scripture, it's always coupled or married to death. The wages of sin is death. The soul that sins, it shall die. Lust brings forth sin. Sin which can see brings forth death. So always remember when sin offers its allurement, when it promises you pleasure, it always comes with a grim reaper in the other hand. Gotcha. And Spart344, thanks for your Patreon question, said, for both, if Cain owes James X amount of dollars and continuously misses his debt payments and I pay his debt, how does this change the fact that Cain cannot be trusted to pay his debt? I don't know how to answer that. Matt, do you want to answer that? It doesn't. Okay. Gotcha. I think that they're maybe saying. Oh, I know what they're saying. So, so there's, there's two things about forgiveness of debt. One is that you no longer owe it. But the second issue is about whether, what, is your, what is your character? What is the foundational problem? And if your problem is that you don't pay your bills, someone else paying them for you does no good. And so if I break your window, if somebody else pays to replace your window, you now have a fresh window. So you're no longer, you know, in the still wronged category. But the person who broke your window is still running around breaking windows. It doesn't solve anything was the point. Oh, well, that's referring to the hypocrite who continues in sin and deceives himself. A genuine believer will turn from sin perpetually. No, it's, it's referring to the problem with substitutionary atonement in the first place. Hmm. Next up, thanks for your super chat. Brian Stevens says, Ray, how many laws of thermodynamics are there? <laughs> Matt, you can tell me that one. I think there's four. I'm not going to get in that. Paul, you're, the one that, you're the one that brought up thermodynamics without knowing the difference between a closed and open system. So, so you don't know? I don't. I don't That's care. Four. Is it four? Good. Yeah, I think so. Paul Rimmer, thanks for your super chat, said, why won't Ray simply ask Matt what he does believe? Matt, what do you believe? With regard to what? That's what I'm wondering. He's, he's like, uh, my only guess is that, let's see. I, I think I think he's referencing every time Ray would just tell me what's what's in my head or make an accusation about what's in my head. So it's mm -hmm. like, 
hey, do, are, am I convinced that a God exists? My answer is no, I'm not convinced that a God exists. Whether or not Ray believes that, I'm not sure what I can do. He keeps saying that I know that a God exists when I don't. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if, he, if he cared about, so the thing is, he thinks he can't be wrong. So if my answer disagrees That's with him. That's not true, Matt. You can't say things about me like that. I'm only, is it, I'm is, it, is it possible that you are wrong about God? It's impossible for God to be wrong, and he's revealed himself. Is it possible for you to be wrong about God? Of course, but it's impossible for God to be wrong about himself, and he's revealed himself in his word. He's the but, creator of the universe. Revealed it to you. To millions. But, so, but can you be wrong about that? I can be wrong about a lot of things. Can you God, be wrong that God has revealed himself to you? God will reveal himself to whoever repents and trusts in Christ. How could I call God a liar? Is that can you, I, I'm not, this has nothing to do with calling God a liar. I don't think God exists. Can you be wrong about whether or not God has revealed I've himself to you? I've about four times and I've, no. And you've, you've danced around it every time. Okay, were you married? Yes. Can you be wrong about that? Um, could I be wrong about that? No. Well, if, now, first of all, let me let me clarify. That's not the same as asserting absolute certainty. I'm doing it within the context of knowledge within the world. Well, that's what I'm doing. Okay. The problem is that you can't demonstrate that your God exists, I don't and need I can demonstrate that I was married. I don't need you, Matt. Yes, you do. If you God. care at all to convince me that you're correct, you I have don't to do need that. To, Matt. That's what the burden of proof is. No. Yes. You don't understand it. I Matt, don't understand the burden of proof. Are you Matt, freaking kidding me? Understand it. I don't need to give you a burden of proof. God has given light. Why to are you man. here? God has given light to every man. You know that God exists. I don't want I to. Do not. I do not. We have to agree to disagree. I, I love that when we're sitting here trying to figure out how you could possibly demonstrate the truth of your conviction. All you do is come back to tell me that I know you're right, which is false. It's not true. I'm not I, saying don't, I don't know that you're right. This is what I'm saying. God has given light to every man. That includes you, man. Yes, you believe that, but one, whether two, or not it's true is a separate issue. Oh, okay. We want right. to next grab a next question. Jeep Zyken 7 thanks for your super chat, said, this is confusing to me, but maybe you guys will be able to know what they mean. Matt is a Christian who God uses his evil for good. Okay, I'm just as confused. Robert Lescom, thanks for your super yeah, chat. Said yeah. Matt, next time someone convinces you to debate, Ray, let's see. Um, they said, "Are are you sure you'll do it?" Let's see. I hope that this has been a fun time for both of you. And it's uh, not been a fun time for Matt. Well, has it, Matt? next next up, Hunter Bailey, thanks for your super chat. Said, "How do you think that that the Jews became Christian?" or that the Jews who became Christian reconciled the atonement of Christ when their life depended on consistency. Ra, uh, Ray, would you please respond too? So they started asking Matt how you think that the Jews who became Christian reconciled the atonement of Christ with their life depended on consistency. I don't know the meaning of that question. Perhaps Matt can understand what they're trying to say. So I, I'm not going to pretend that I, that I fully understand the question, but it seems that they're asking... First of all, you could ask th those Jews, because rather than have me try to read their mind, but what I will say is that it's possible for people to become convinced of something um, for bad reasons, whether it's in their best interest or in opposition to their best interest. Gotcha. And next up, thanks for your super chat from Tiffany Bear, who said, let's see, don't mind the mockers in the live chat. Quote, blessed it's are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Thanks for that. Edward Elric, thanks for your super chat, said, Ray, if this debate stops, that means God exists. If this debate doesn't stop, does that mean God doesn't exist? Can you reconcile your absolutist position? No. Um, but I would like to say to those atheists that are watching, um, there's a video we put up yesterday. It's free on YouTube. It's called Richard Dawkins Crushes Banana Man. And it's the full story of, uh, of what happened with the whole Banana Man thing. And that's why we talked about bananas before. So I just want to take the opportunity. It's free. Richard Dawkins Crushes Banana Man, which is me. You got it. And Happy Dude, thanks for your super chat, said, best debate ever. That's like all credit to the speakers. I... 
absolutely thrilling today. And Ken Patton, thanks for your super chat, which was a super sticker. So do want to take a moment. We're going to read through more questions, but want to remind you as we have, eh, I would say maybe a little shy of half an hour, we do want to remind you our guests are linked in the description in case you just arrived. And with that, jumping into the next one, Converse Contender, thanks for your super chat, said best channel on YouTube. Thanks a lot, Converse. Especially appreciate all your help, buddy. Dean Meadows, thanks for your super chat, said Ray, I'm a Christian and I do struggle to see how I can accept the Gospels without first investigating. Would we accept the Revolutionary War took place without investigating whether or not there is data to support it? That's a good question. I wasn't converted by the Gospels. I wasn't converted by the Bible. I was converted by the power of God. When I came to Christ, God opened up my understanding. He uh, took me out of darkness into light. He made me a brand new creature. For, for 22 years as a non-Christian, I never thought about God for two seconds, seriously. For the last 48 years, there's hardly been two seconds when I haven't thought about God because it's so transforming when you're born again. When that happens, the Bible will come alive. And until that time, if you read scriptures with a proud heart, you're like a man who tries to read a book in the dark. Nothing will happen. You first need the new birth, and then the Gospels will come alive to you. And they harmonize perfectly, by the way. All these people that say there's not harmony of the Gospels I don't know what they're talking about. Gotcha. And Anthony Roden asks both speakers why this debate. I, I think they're asking, why have you come to this debate? Sure. Somebody asked me if I, because once upon a time I said I would, wouldn't bother debating Ray again, because he said dur during the one debate that we did on a Christian radio station in Minneapolis, St. Paul, that he's not interested in debate. He's not interested in proving anything. He just loves me and wants to make sure I go to heaven. So he was there to preach. And I was more interested in debate. I've shifted to where I'm still doing debates, but I, I want to have discussions. So it's not like 10 minutes here, five minutes here, 10 minutes here, five minutes here. It's you state your case, I state my case, and then we discuss it openly with a moderator to make sure somebody doesn't get stomped on. I'm open to having those kind of discussions with a, a lot of people. And so this seemed like worth giving it one more try. Well, that's really great. I'm here because I love Matt, care about where he spends eternity. Nothing's changed since that's first, our first chat. And I love those unsaved people. That's what the Bible calls non-Christians, unsaved, that are watching today. And I hope they'll think seriously about their eternal salvation because there's nothing more important. Gotcha. And Edward Ear Elric says, Ray, what makes you more correct than any other religion that claims to be the one true religion? Every other religion has a book that says something to that effect. Well, that's a really good question, too, and one that comes up regularly. If you study all the great religions, and when I say great, I mean large, like Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism, you'll find they're all what's called works righteousness religions. They think they can earn eternal life by doing things like good works and fasting and praying and facing Mecca and sitting on hard pews or whatever. The Bible changes everything when the moral law comes in. It paints us as guilty criminals standing before a holy God who's judgment is waiting to come upon us so anything we offer the judge of the universe that's what the bible calls god is not good works or religious works it's actually an attempt to bribe the judge of the universe and the bible says the sacrifice of the wicked or bribery is an abomination of the lord earthly judge won't be bribed if he's a good judge and god will not be bribed on judgment day the only thing that can save us is not our good religious works but it's the mercy of the judge and that's what god expressed in christ you know, atheists have that little thing where God uh, sacrificed himself to himself. No, that's just not true. The Bible says God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God was manifest in the flesh. It says a body you prepared for me, and God filled that body as a hand fills a glove. And this perfect sinless man gave his life as a sacrifice for the sin of the world. And that means the judge, because of the sacrifice, can dismiss our case. He can legally take the death sentence off us and let us live forever um, because of what Jesus did on the cross through his death and resurrection. What an incredible thing. You know, here's another thing that probably make Matt angry, but I got to say it. Every single human being is tormented or haunted by the fear of death. Some admit it, some don't, but we know we're going to die. And there's something in us that says, oh, I don't want to die because life is precious. And God is offering us everlasting life through the gospel. So all these issues about atheism and, and evolution and other things, hypocrisy within the church, don't really matter. What matters is where you're going to spend eternity and what will happen to you if death seized upon you tonight. 
And so forget about all these other religions and what other people do. Get yourself right with God. And Jesus said, if you do that, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. Ken Patton, thanks for your super chat or super sticker, I should say. Appreciate it. And Andreas Elda, thanks for your super chat, said to Matt, I love the beaver dam analogy. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Roy Segal, thanks for your super chat, said, shut up and take my money, James. Appreciate that support, Roy. Edward Elric, thanks for your super chat, said, Ray, millions of people talk to God and they still have COVID. God has done nothing for them and God has done nothing for the world. It's not true. Every drop of your blood that's in your veins is a gift from God. Every vein that holds the blood, the breath in your mouth, your eyes, your ears, your brain are a gift to you from God. And being a Christian doesn't mean you're not, not going to get disease. If we fall over, we bruise. If we, uh, if we get disease, we die. We're all going to die anyway. It's survival of the fittest and nobody survives. But God says he'll make you fit to survive. So a Christian is someone who conquers death through the power of the Holy Spirit. Here's, here's the essence of what I'm saying. Christianity does not guarantee a smooth flight, but it does guarantee a safe landing. I know I'm safe from death and hell because of what Jesus did on the cross. So being a Christian means you can be thrown to lions, to, like happened to early Christians. It means that you can be martyred like the first 11 Christians. Read Fox's Book of Martyrs and see how trials and, and persecution comes to everyone who stands up for the gospel. But... Um, the joy of having everlasting life is what takes you through those things. Gotcha. And Taran Martian, thanks for your super chat, said, Ray, do sinners deserve unending torment? Um, the Bible says sinners will be damned. Everything we love in this life will be ripped from us. We enjoy the pleasures of sex and, and love and laughter and friends and family and all these fruits and the beauty of the blue sky and the warmth of the sun and the sound of birds and puppies and kittens. All those things are gifts from God, and God says, I'm going to take those gifts from you, and I'm going to give you your just dessert. God's going to do that which is right on the day of judgment, and I trust him. I love what Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher, said. He says, faith may swim where reason, where reason may only paddle. When I can't work out something, I just trust God, and he'll bring it to pass. He'll do what he should. Gotcha, and thanks, X, a.k.a. Hello Kitty, who sent a sticker saying, game over. Next, logical, plausible, probable, thanks for your super chat, who said, James, please give a shout out for our after show. Logical, plausible, probable is their after show. I will put that link in the description, folks. And they said, open mic to share what you think about this debate, who won and who had the best zingers. Gotcha, thanks for that. And next up, Jungle Jargon, thanks for your super chat, said, Matt, uh, can, or James, can you ask Matt why he stands behind atheism when atheism can't say what is, and that makes no sense? Do we really need Ray to ask me that? Uh, I, I, mean, I mean, you literally put a question in and paid for the question to be asked. And you want, so, Ray, please ask me what this listener would like you to ask me. Oh, no, this, they, they asked, uh, I might have, I might have, uh, didn't get a lot of sleep last night. If I said Ray, I meant to say uh, James. Ask Matt oh, okay. why he stands behind atheism when atheism can't say what is, and that makes no sense. I don't fully understand sure. myself. So first of all, I don't stand behind atheism. Atheism isn't something that you stand behind. It's not a worldview. It's not a proposition. It is simply the label that we put on, at a minimum, someone who isn't convinced that a God exists, and at a maximum, someone who is convinced that no gods exist. I don't stand behind it. And whether or not atheism can tell me anything is irrelevant, because I have other things that tell me about stuff. I have science and science methodologies which tell me about things. I have logic and reason and understanding fallacies and understanding how to construct an argument and sound epistemology. Those are the things that I stand behind. I don't stand behind atheism. If somebody convinces me that a God exists, I'm no longer an atheist, but I'm still a humanist. I'm still a sensible, rational person who values logic and evidence. Gotcha. And thanks so much for your super chat from Bruce Wayne. Thanks for your super sticker, I should say. Tons of mice. Let's see. Thanks for your super chat. Said, Ray, when was the last time that you ate a banana? Oh, I eat them regularly. For years, I couldn't eat them, as you'll see uh, when you watch that uh, video we put up called uh, Richard Dawkins uh, Crushes Banana Man. It's very interesting, and it gives the whole story. You got it. And the Wumble... <laughs> 
the the Wumble Biter, thanks for your super chat, said, is Ray the arbiter of God's truth or his God? God's the arbiter of truth, but he's entrusted the gospel to whoever wants to spread it. The, the, the Great Commission is given to every Christian, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So that's our commission. I'm no expert. I just know God. I love God. And I don't want anyone to end up in hell. And that's why I'm talking to Matt today, because I care about him. Gotcha. And Roy Segal, thanks for your super chat, who said, hit the like button, you heathens. <laughs> gotcha. And uh, let's see. Next up. Got, oh, okay. We, we got that one. Cry, thanks for your super chat, said, hey, Ray, how do you account that the basis for your belief in the resurrection is so controversial throughout the Gospels, and how do you account for the fact that Mark was edited to add an ending? I don't believe the resurrection because the Gospels tell me Jesus rose from the dead. I believe the resurrection took place because the risen living Christ manifested himself to me and to anyone who repent and trust the Savior. Let me share John 14, 21. Jesus said, he that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me, and he that loves me will be loved by my Father. I too will love him and will reveal myself to him. So there's the gauntlet. Just repent, trust in the Savior, confess and forsake your sins. Trust in him as your sin bearer, and you'll know the truth. Truth will make you free. You'll pass from death to life. You've got God's promise on it, and God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. Gotcha. The problem the, the problem is that while all of that is based on just an assertion, because if somebody trusts the gospel, puts their faith in God as, to the best of their ability, and then doesn't wind up a believer, Ray and his ilk will just write them off. Well, you hardened your heart. You had something wrong. You didn't do it right. It, it, there's no, basically, this is what I mean when Ray's set up a, a model, or not, he didn't set it up, other people set it up, so that it can't be wrong, because if in fact you do the things that he says you need to do to be saved and you don't become convinced and you're not a believer, well, you did something wrong because God can't be wrong. And that is a, a heads I win, tails you lose scenario. That's right. You're going to lose, Matt. You don't want to lose your soul. Uh, I don't even have a soul. Yes, you do. There's a life in you that's speaking to me now. That's your soul. You have that's a not a soul. That's oxygen and air that I'm compressing out of my lungs across my vocal cords with my mouth making a shape. I'm doing this because my brain, and when my brain is dead, everything that makes me me, all of the available evidence points to the fact that it ends. Not only that, all of the things that make me me can be altered while I'm still alive through brain damage. There's zero evidence for a soul. I was talking to a professor at UCLA, Peter Nomax, and he says, I don't believe in the soul. I said, did you know the Bible uses the word soul and life synonymously? He says, oh, I believe in the soul then. The soul is your life within your body. When Matt was four years old, he didn't look like he did to, does today. He's a mature man today. But when he was four, he was still the same soul, or the same personality that he is today. And that's what's going to pass on when he dies. That's why he'll be brain dead when he dies, because the life has passed on and he's going to stand before God. And I want to see him saved, not lost for eternity. And thanks for your super chat from Insect Facet says, Matt, I think that methodological naturalism strongly implies functional naturalism. Am I wrong? No, I think it strongly implies that. It's just that, you know, it's like correlation isn't causation. So the fact that methodological naturalism as a method limits what we can investigate. It's not so much that methodological naturalism implies naturalism. It's that uh, as we keep finding explanations that are consistent with methodological naturalism, it becomes far more difficult to make a case for something beyond naturalism. I'm still open to the possibility. Anybody could, could demonstrate at any time, but yeah, I, I generally agree. Next up, Anamorphic Mind, thanks for your super chat, asked Matt, why do you think it is that theists use the arguments that they use? Because they're convincing. Because, so if you go to someone and you say, you know that you've done bad things, that's true for probably everybody. There are people without a conscience and you know, there are people with certain conditions, but by and large, we've all done bad things. The issue here is that Ray's model has bad things are defined by a God who is the judge and the arbiter and, and the creator and the, the one able to intervene on your behalf. My view of whether or not things are bad are not based on a book, a God, 
or any of those. It is about evaluating the consequences of the actions we take with regard to the goal of a better world. And while that's not completely defined, there, we, we can't sit around and pretend that we don't know some things. Like, oh, I'm going to break my own rule, but we're not going to get into it. Uh, I would think that Ray and I would both agree that owning other people as property is immoral. Right, Ray? Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. And thanks for your super chat from Luke Rappaport. Let's see. They said, Matt, what do you think about Ray's question about the origin of the universe? How can you have a worldview that doesn't for the origin, doesn't have an explanation for the origin of the world itself? So here's the thing that that question is bizarre. How can you have a worldview that doesn't account for the origin? So a worldview shouldn't be accepted just because it offers some potential explanation for everything. A worldview should be accepted for offering correct and likely correct explanations for things. The fact that my worldview doesn't have an explanation for X doesn't mean that my worldview is flawed. As long as my worldview is open to an explanation for X that is consistent with good standards of evidence. So I don't know why there's something rather than nothing. Maybe it couldn't have been any other way. Maybe there's some agent who intervened. Maybe there's some other explanation. How absolutely arrogant would it be to say, I have a worldview and it provides me an explanation for everything. That's just, that's laziness. That's somebody who doesn't care about the truth. They're just really uncomfortable with not being able to acknowledge when they're wrong. Who says that? Who says what? They have a worldview that gives an explanation for everything. Does, does your worldview include a God that knows everything? Yeah. Then your worldview includes an explanation for everything. You just don't personally, you just don't personally have those explanations. You That's just good. trust that there's a God who does. Okay, I appreciate you qualifying that. Thank you. Next, Robert Ursu, thanks for your super chat, said one person does a good deed because God told them to. Another person does the same good deed because they think it's the right thing to do. Which person is more moral? Both answer this, please, and thank you. The second one. Well, God knows the motive. I don't. Gotcha. The motive is included in the question. And mm-hmm. Sohan D'Souza, thanks for your super chat, said substitutionary atonement hang, is... Hang, hang on, James. So this, this person asked a question that included everything in the question that you needed to assess it. And in, instead of just answering, you just said, God knows. But Well, there's a reason I did asking what you think. Well, Matt, here's the reason I did that. I was trying to get my dog over here, and I didn't hear the question. Okay. So I apologize for that. So would that count as a lie? Well, it was. I wasn't listening to the question. So clearly. you misrepresented that you had heard no, the question God and provided an answer. God so I would say that's a lie, right? No, God knows. And what's wrong with the lying? Explain to me what's wrong with the lying. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying that there's anything necessarily wrong with lying in all circumstances. What I'm talking about is you seem to have, you, you honestly admitted that you misrepresented the truth a moment ago. And no, that, God, God knows everything. You, I told you he's omniscient. But he asked about your thoughts and you didn't hear the question. Well, the, the mo- God knows the motive of every single person. If That's you didn't hear the about. question, then how could you possibly answer that God I knows the motive? Calculate a guess. I think that you're lying about not lying now. It would be really well, easy to okay. just say, you know what? I screwed up. Maybe I lied. Yeah, God's my judge. Next up, Sohan D'Souza, thanks for your super chat, said substitutionary atonement is more like someone claiming to have self-flagellated to pay your debt for blasphemy against the great fairy queen than it is to someone paying your speeding ticket backlog. I don't know. I don't think that was a question. I think it was a statement. Definitely. Yes, for the, the super chats, we'll, we'll allow people to make a statement as long as we give it a chance for the speaker to make a response. If you'd like. I don't have anything to add. Gotcha. And Insect Facet, thanks for your super chat, said, Ray, had your understanding about any aspect of God ever changed throughout your lifetime? If so, what prompted the change? Oh, yeah, of course. When I was a new Christian, my understanding of God was very, very shallow. And as I've studied his word, I've got to understand the character of God more. But it's something that grows. The mind of God is infinite. No man can understand God's mind. I can hardly work out how my iPad works. You know, I can call my my sister 7,000 miles away on my iPhone, and there's no wires. I still use it. So I... um, 
uh, uh, will have eternity to uh, explore the mind of God. Gotcha. And Luke Rappaport, thanks for your super chat, said, question for Matt, how do you explain info in DNA, fine-tuning of the laws of physics and constants, and the origin of consciousness from mindless matter? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I would ask you to read that question again, but I think we can summarize that question is, please explain everything in science that may or may not have an explanation. So um, the, the thing that is perceived as information within DNA is actually just chemicals interaction interacting with each other according to the laws of physics. And then you want me to explain the laws of physics? I don't know that they could have been any other way, despite what some intelligent design proponents want to suggest. Uh, and also, I'm not a physicist. And so uh, now you want me to also explain uh, the rise of consciousness, something that is a problem that we probably haven't had any solution from, from some of the biggest experts that have worked on it. And so I'll just say, I don't know. Thanks. Gotcha. And next up, thanks for your super chat from Religion is BS. I'm responding again. This is the one who said he'd go out of existence if he got to partner with you, Matt. Said, Matt, my comment was tongue in cheek. I'm a massive fan. And Jason Muse, thanks for your super chat, said, Mr. Comfort, how do you account for your epistemology or how you come to know things? Like, what are the, maybe the way or ways? Oh, I, uh, I listen to other men's teachings. I read books and I read the scriptures. Thanks. And Anthony Magnabasco, thanks for your super chat, said, Ray, if you eventually discovered to your satisfaction that you had no good evidence for God, would you still strongly believe that God exists? That's in line with the question. If I discovered my wife didn't exist, will I still be married to her? It's a ridiculous question. doesn't make any sense at all. What atheists don't realize is that our knowledge of God is not a, a belief, not an intellectual belief, but an experiential, not, experiential knowledge. We know God. This is eternal life. They might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So I can't unknow God. Gotcha. And Martin Dugas, thanks for your super chat. If you have a question to attach, let me know. Otherwise, thanks for your support. And Jerry Hotep, or Hotep, thanks for your super chat, said, Ray, aren't you in the clergy project? I'm not sure what that is. Is that like a ministry or? I, I don't think I am. If I am, <laughs> someone tell me. Gotcha. Edward Elric, thanks for your super chat, said, Matt, uh, yeah, this is the one that, let's see, let me read this and see if I can make sense of it. The debate doesn't stop. Does that mean it doesn't exist? So they said, Matt, if the debate stops, that means God exists. If the debate doesn't stop, does that mean God doesn't exist? Please chime in. Mm. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to be as as kind of straightforward, charitable on this as I can. I think what they're suggesting is that because the God proposition is ultimately unfalsifiable demonstrating that a God exists would end all debate on the subject and then everybody would agree. But if the debate never ends, does that show that God doesn't exist? No, because it's an unfalsifiable proposition, which means there's no way to falsify it, which is why as long as there are people who are willing to accept unfalsifiable uh, claims that they don't have to support with evidence, then people will continue to believe and the debate will continue. Gotcha. And thanks for your super chat from... Joe Famous said, for both, does the Christian gospel make sense? Uh, anybody change their mind today? Never mind. Looks like they're on the same page. And thanks for your super chat. We appreciate it. We are, we're getting into, we can maybe do one or two more beyond that, like, heads up that I gave everybody that we're, I pro, I'm so sorry, folks. We won't be able to get to every single super chat. And uh, we'll get to a few more since I gave that warning that we might not get to them. So, Edward Elric, thanks for your super chat, said, let's see, we had that one already. Mistake not, thanks for your super chat, said, Ray, let's see, do you ever get exhausted of debates? I get exhausted in it, but not of it. Anytime someone listens to what I have to say with a humble heart, it thrills me beyond words. Just the other day, I was uh, riding my bike, saw a guy standing there, and I uh, said, you want to do an interview on YouTube? And he came run up, he says, yes, I do. And he was very humble, very open to the gospel. And that thrills my heart. And I just want to give a little plug for our YouTube channel. It's just passed 123 million views. 
And I think people love watching it because it's interesting to see what people believe about the afterlife. Because the question that starts off almost every interview is, do you think there's an afterlife? And uh, most people do. And uh, it's great when people open their heart and listen to the gospel. It seems that what Ray refers to as a humble heart, I would refer to as someone with an unskeptical mind. Because yeah. all, all I'm doing is, there's it, nothing prideful or boastful. It is about evidence. It is about epistemology. It is about how can you demonstrate the truth of what you say. And if you can't, that's fine. But you can't expect anybody reasonable to believe it. Now, the existence of God is axiomatic. That's why the Bible says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. <laughs> Next up, uh, thanks for your super chat from Keith Black said, Ray, if God hasn't shown up and made himself clear to me, shouldn't I assume that he doesn't care? Asking since you don't, uh, like I, I don't, they said they don't see the evidence. Yeah, like I said, the existence of God is axiomatic. Everybody has a light given to them by God. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. The Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the promise of scripture. If someone calls upon the name of the Lord and nothing happens, it's usually evidence they didn't trust him. The scriptures say, he that comes to God must first believe that he exists and he's the reward of those that diligently seek him. For Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Most of our lives are built on faith. The reason we have the arms race is because Nations don't trust each other. When we get on a plane, we trust pilots with our lives. When a doctor gives us pills and we take them without question, we're trusting our lives to pharmaceutical companies. When we go on to stop, stop lights and stop at the lights, we're trusting our lives to lights. When we step on the car brakes, we're trusting the brakes. We exercise trust everywhere. Well, all these things can let us down, but if you trust God, he promises he'll never let you down. He's able to save to the uttermost those that come to God by him. Gotcha. And thanks for it, your... It's, so when it comes to trusting doctors, pilots, lights, etc., it's because we, A, have an understanding of how they work. B, we have regulatory intervention in order to assure that if something goes wrong, there's some way to actually seek recompense for that. And to make sure that, you know, hey, we don't just allow anybody to build and sell a car. There's, you know, you want to make sure that you're putting people in those seats. The sort of trust that we have in pilots who are incredibly well trained, have to demonstrate competency and skill and fall underneath a whole bunch of regulations about how they, what they can and can't do with their time. That is to make, increase the amount of safety as much as possible. It is to make our trust proportional to the evidence supporting it. This That's is true. the exact opposite of what is the case with a God. That's not true. It is true. You can't, you can't show me a God. You can't show me a God certificate. You can't show me evidence that shows that there's anything that this God can trust. And every time you say, God will do this, it always comes with an asterisk, which you don't include until I ask, which is, hey, if I do this, you said everybody who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If I did that, am I saved? Well, no, 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 no. You might have done it wrong. You might have been a false convert. You set up a no-lose scenario for God, or somebody does. That's not the same thing as confidence in established evidence and people working towards a safer society. Well, that's your belief. And it's right. And I back it up by evidence. Talk about I back it. it up by evidence. And your belief is backed I'm up by, right your belief is backed up by just making assertions on, and then saying, man. oh, that's your belief. One man, two, I'm right. One. That's exactly what you've accused me of saying through this whole interview. The, pr the difference is that I demonstrated it with argument and evidence and you just make assertions. If you, if you don't think that I'm right, prove it. I don't need to. Uh, I know. Because you think it's an axiom. Just to uh, want to get to these, these next questions. Appreciate it, Matthew Steele. These are the last ones we can get to and then we've got to let our guests go. Thanks for your super chat, Matthew. said, Ray, is it possible for anyone, Christian or otherwise, to judge whether God is just and good? You don't, need a, you don't need a judge if God is just and good. You trust that he is because he's without sin. The Bible says God is light and in, them, in him there is no darkness at all. That's a prerequisite for coming to Christ. You trust God. You justify God. And you can see what he says is true. Man is evil by nature. We lock our doors. We lock our cars because we, man, we know that all around us there is danger because sin dwells in the heart of every human being. Everything God says in his word is true. You can trust it. You can throw yourself blindfolded and without reserve into his mighty hands because he's, because he's faithfully promised. That's my experience and the experience of literally millions around the world. 
Thank you. And Matthew Steele, last question for the day. Thanks for your super chat. Said Matt, what are your thoughts on monism versus dualism? Well, there's there's not sufficient evidence for dualism. And as a matter of fact, when we talk about it, it seems to be that what we lack is an understanding and the appropriate language to actually address what we're talking about. Um, so I, as I'm not a dualist. Gotcha. And partially because I don't think the second thing is real. You bet. And want to say thanks so much, everybody. Want to say thanks so much for our mods. You do a terrific job. Thanks for helping us make this possible. Thanks, everybody, just for hanging out, watching, just partying with us. It's always a great time. And most of all, thanks so much to our guests who are linked in the description in case you'd like to hear more, folks. We really appreciate you, both Ray and Matt. It's been a true pleasure to have you. Thank you, James. Appreciate it. Thanks. thanks, Matt. Nice to see you again. You too, Ray. Absolutely. And one last shout out as Logical, Plausible, Probable is hosting an after show that's linked in the description. If anybody wants to host another after show, in addition, we will link as many after shows as there are. So with that, I want to say thanks so much for being with us today, everybody. It's been a great time. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. Take care, folks. <laughs>